Joni, oh. it's so nice to see you again. I am so excited tonight. We have Dr. Rodney Lohman for our inaugural kickoff SCP podcast. Uh, not only is Rodney the series editor, but he is the author of the intro to consulting psychology. And I just, uh, I, I don't want to give it all away, but I, I know that, that you're, you're excited as I am about our, our interview we had with him. What was your take? Yeah, I loved, I mean, knowing what the book is about is an obvious, right? For the people who haven't read it yet, but there was some really interesting add-ons like him being the series editor talking about where the series is going and what they're looking for and actually thinking about wanting to write, like what it's all about. Um, also his experience, you know, as an author and consultant, really, I, I think it was really interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'm wedding each and every one of you watching this podcast has at least one of Dr. Lohman's books on your shelf, whether it's the yeah. Handbook of Organizational Consulting Psychology or one of these series. We cannot wait for you to watch Rodney Lohman in our inaugural podcast. Please leave a comment below. And if you have any questions, please reach out to Society of Consulting Psychology. Here we go. Well, Nick, I'm pretty excited about this because we actually have the series editor today who also has written two of the books in the Fundamentals of Consulting Psych uh, series. And today we're going to talk to Rodney about an introduction to consulting psychology, which I have on my Kindle here. Um, but uh, you can also get paper copies. Yep, there we go, Rodney. <laughs> and we have like really fancy visuals that we can also throw in too. So um, this is really exciting for me and a great honor. Thank you, Rodney, for agreeing to do this interview. Sure, my, first my, question, my first question though is, I mean, what inspired you to write this book? I mean, in, you know, an, an introduction to consulting psychology, I'm, I'm kind of curious about it because it's it's kind of an obvious title in the series, but it's not the first one. And so, yeah, so tell us a little bit about how this came to be and what inspired you to do this. So consulting psychology is an area that many people come to in circuitous ways. So uh, there are very few programs, both in the US and internationally, specifically in consulting psychology. So a lot of folks have trained in other areas like industrial organizational or uh, clinical or counseling psychology, and then they gravitate to consulting psychology because they find that that's really where they're best suited for. Um, and so it follows that <clears throat> a lot of folks are gonna be learning and becoming experts in consulting psychology um, not just through the classroom, but also through reading and exposing themselves to the literature in this area. And so in consulting psychology, we wanted through the book series to have uh, a number of topics that the field of consulting psychology gets involved with, but covered in an accessible way in a that's why it's called fundamentals of consulting psychology these are not big thick textbooks they're about 150 pages or so um each or sometimes a little less than that um but the the goal is to cover that topic well and to help people who are moving in this area uh to have a good exposure to it and so the uh, the book we're talking about today is kind of an overview of consulting psychology. And that's what the intent was. The series was started for the same reason, and we see it as something that is growing and expanding. We have 11 titles now in print and hope to add some more as well. But that's what this book was all about, is this was sort of intended to be the foundation and an overview of the whole field. You know, as I'm reading the book, I mean, and rereading it, I mean, probably for the nth time, preparing mm -hmm. for our discussion today, I'm thinking, wow, you really have to know a lot about consulting to psychology, mm -hmm. consulting psychology to write a book about consulting psychology. Like, 
it's at the individual level, the group level, the organizational level. And I mean, how did you become able to know so much about consulting psychology? Well, let, let me give you a, a short uh, thumbnail of how I came to really embrace consulting psychology. And this will be not, not the long version, but um, I started out with a bachelor's degree in uh, business. I went into the military at a time you had to do that. When I got out, I was still kind of trying to focus on what would be my particular area. And I went back and got a second bachelor's degree in psychology. And one of my professors said, well, you should go into industrial organizational psychology, you know, with you having this business and psychology background. So I applied to a bunch of schools, uh, graduate schools in the field and ended up uh, going to graduate school in IO psychology at Michigan State University, um, which at the time and still is one of the premier yeah. IO psychology yeah. programs. <clears throat> well, unlike most of my colleagues there, I also had an interest in clinical psychology. So I ended up doing the training in both clinical and IO uh, psychology, which was not particularly supported by either <laughs> area. But one of the things I um, found out of that is um, consulting psychology was a good way to put these two interests together. And just as the field consists of work at the individual group organizational level, uh, so, you know, clinical psych at least then focused primarily and to some extent still does at the individual level. IO psychology, although it's a lot of stuff about individual differences, they're also more concerned about group and organization selection, working in organization development and, and the like. And so consulting psych is an area that puts these together. And you're absolutely right. There's a lot to learn to be able to work effectively and competently at each of those um, at each of those uh, levels. And so for me, consulting psychology has been a particularly nice way to put my various interests together. And I tried to reflect that in the book uh, as well. Well, I think that's a very humble response, Rodney, you know, that you've uh, created uh, and taught in uh, consulting psychology programs, and you've worked a lot with the APA to develop the field. And uh, so there, there must be a lot there that, that you've done as well as just writing about it and, and con actually doing the consulting work, right? Um, right. Yeah. Well, Nick, you know, what I think you, that uh, what do you want to know? Yeah, <laughs> you know uh, the, what? What I love, Rodney, about about your writings is, you know, as as many people within society of consulting psychology and and psyop, um, your books uh, and a couple of your books generally reside on the shelves of of a number of us. Um, and as we got them uh, in in graduate school, right? I mean, your voice and your authorship is for some of us how we really framed the uh, individual team and organizational. Uh, uh, landscapes, right, and lenses in which we we, we look at uh, how we work with our clients. Um, but as it relates to this book, um, you know, thinking that we do have, you know, wide variety of individuals listening to this podcast from uh, seasoned uh, nationally or worldly uh, recognized professionals like yourself to um, entry level consulting psychologists or even graduate students. Um, from this book, what's maybe one or two things that you can share with us and, and our viewers, uh, what the book is about and what you hope people walk away uh, from, from their reading this book? So I hope that people would walk away from reading the book with a word that Joni mentioned or alluded to a bit ago, and that is humility because there are a lot of folks with various kinds of training who may gravitate to some aspect of consulting like coaching or whatever and think that that's all there is to it. The model that thirteen Division 13 Society of Consulting Psych and certainly 
the model that I have is that we have to be competent to work at the individual level, the group, and the organizational. Even if we choose to specialize in one of those areas, we need to know about the other two so that we are able to be effective. <clears throat> For example, there are some clinical counseling psychologists who move, gravitate into uh, coaching roles or dealing with work-related issues and therapy and the like, and they can bring some good skills to the field, but they also can bring some skills that need to be modified. And for example, if somebody that I'm seeing as a clinician is complaining about uh, their relationship with their boss at work and the uh, psychologist or the therapist interprets that in terms of their relationships with their family of origin or with their father, for example, that may be true, but it equally well may be that that's not particularly relevant. And so if you don't know much about the workplace, the various kinds of workplaces that there are, if you don't know much about supervision and so forth, you're not going to be able to be as helpful if you're working at the individual level. Conversely, if you're working at the organizational level and you just see what's going on as numbers on a spreadsheet and you don't have much understanding of what those numbers represent and the people who are uh, affected by the decisions that are made and how they are made and how they are implemented, you're also going to be at a disadvantage. So ideally, people who work in consulting psychology would have supervised experience and knowledge of the literature at each of these three levels, and then they will put them together in various ways, and maybe they'll just choose to specialize in one area, uh, say coaching or organizational level interventions. But if they, even if they do that, they will be much more effective, I argue, because of their knowledge of the other areas as well. One of the things I loved about your book um, is that you're, you make it so interesting. I mean, it's an introductory book, you know, and you're thinking, oh, no, I'm just going to sort of get the dry coverage of what this is about. But there are stories in there and like the history and like who did was doing what, when and how this came about and, and what's going on now. And and it's like, wow, this is actually quite fascinating, you know, so um having that breadth there uh, and, and the historical background really helps make it a good story. But also, I'm, I'm curious, like, where do you get some of the, the actual consulting examples from? Are these from your consulting work or from others? Or, yeah, what, what, how did you get those? So, so most of the things about which I write are either um, things that I have personally experienced in my work or their aggregates um, that are put together, you know, to assure confidentiality and that sort of thing. And occasionally there are things, there are situations that have been shared with me by other uh, folks who have been working in the field. <clears throat> I've always uh, found that a literature in this area as well as some others, but a literature that is not just uh, cold and dispassionate <laughs> numbers, you know, like are used in selection, mm -hmm. uh, designing a selection test and making decisions about groups of people and so forth, th that um, they need to be, they're more engaging in my opinion anyway, they're more engaging when people actually get the feel and the look and um, of the uh, of, of the work that's going on. Now that reminds me of one of my mentors at Michigan State University who was a professor named Carl Frost, 
who was a clinical psychologist by uh, training, but who moved into the um, uh, organizational consulting arena. And this was a long time ago. He actually worked at MIT uh, and worked with Joe Scanlon and a participative management team. And when he was brought to Michigan State, it was to help provide the same kind of work that was being done with farmers and agriculture in the field, but in the area of organizational consulting. And one of the things he did was to take graduate students along with him on his consulting uh, <clears throat> trips. Um, and we got to see firsthand what some of this is like and so forth. And that always helped me better understand what what's what does this really look like? What does it feel like? What is it like to work, you know, with people? What are the dynamics that you see of the organization when you're going around meeting with senior executives, but also the rank and file workers on the floor and so forth? And so that's a little bit of what I would like to incorporate in my writing is um, help people have a real experience of what it's like to do this work and hopefully they say oh yeah that's interesting i'd like to do that or if they say you know yeah i get it but that's not what i want to do that's fine too <laughs> at least you have a better understanding of why you're making that choice or decision yeah i i would agree with joni that the examples that you you paint in the book do give anybody who isn't a part of this profession a really good look of what the day-to-day -day is. And I think that that, for me, it, it sold that it was what I want to do, but conversely, run right into your point, and maybe what people don't want to do. And in thinking about this this book and, and how it was written and how it is such a great text, um, we obviously are in an industry that is, is changing you know, rapidly, uh, post-COVID and in and, and the year since. Uh, if you were to write the book today, or if you were to go back and revisit it, what might you add, or what might you take away, or what might you change about it? Well, I will at some point likely do a second edition of this uh, book, and what I would like to do is keep the the spine, so to speak, the same. That is the concept of individuals, groups, organizations has not changed. You know, those are the basic fundamentals with which we work. But of course, the reality of people's day-to-day -day lives in the workplace, which is especially where we're involved, those have changed and the concept of work has changed. So, you know, mostly from the question of, you know, examples that might speak to more recent times, those would be things that I think could benefit from uh, uh, mod being modified in new edition. Certainly, when that book was written, we certainly had not had COVID, <laughs> and we also more to the point though we hadn't had um, we hadn't had remote uh, work as a way of life hard to believe, but we didn't have Zoom. <laughs> we didn't have things like what we're using now, which has really radically transformed work around the world. Now, I argue that that doesn't mean we have to reinvent consulting psychology. It means, however, that we want to make it accessible in different kinds of ways. And some of the things people will be dealing with are different, but I think the core fundamental skill set that we bring to the table does need to be adapted over time, but the fundamentals, in my view, don't. You know, they stay the same. I'd have to agree with that. I mean, again, I said I've read and reread the book, and it applies today. Uh, I like the idea of what you said, though, adding uh, more modern examples mm -hmm. of how work has changed. Um, you know, I would I would ask. Um, you know, what unexpected opportunities have arisen for you as a result of writing this book? I mean, this particular mm. book, not just the series, but yeah. Well, as you probably know, I have um, 
written extensively throughout my career, both in books and book chapters and journal articles and all of that. And all of that, to me, has been a way of having influence and of reaching a broader audience than I would be able to do if I was just working, you know, without that. And so it's I've had the occasion because of my writing primarily, but also for other reasons, um, to do work in uh, South Africa, in the Philippines, um, in Malaysia, um, and so forth. And so that's broadened my understanding and my horizon and perspectives. And it it would not have happened probably without having that kind of involvement. I've I've also, for me, writing is just something I like to do. But and I, it would be difficult for me not to be engaged with that in some perspective. But I've also worked with some folks, including in this series, where authors really didn't have an extensive um, background in writing and publishing, where they were able to um, uh, get things published that I think were very useful for the literature, but also very useful for them. Because I think when you write about it, you have to really uh, speak to it in a way that is accessible to other people. And so um, there's a discipline in that. But I think also people who have done that oftentimes find, oh, well, I'm looked to now as someone with expertise in this area. And so people get um, can get um, you know, consultation projects and so forth, in part because people recognize their, you know, their work in that, in that area. So I guess that's you know, what, yeah, first say. You know, I'm yeah, thinking yeah. of Rodney, you know, as a, as an organization, right, as a society of consulting psychology, we're always <laughs> hearing people talk about writing, right, and wanting to be better writers. Um, and obviously, you being such a great writer, I'm wondering if you would share a little bit about your process. Um, and then maybe around this book, right, you know, what, what is it like to have written this book, uh, and then to collaborate, uh, possibly with some of the other authors mm -hmm. in this series? Well, the in, in terms of how I work, it's how most writers work. And that is, I get that most of writing is about editing. <laughs> and editing yeah. means you, <laughs> you the author, uh, editing and editing. Uh, every author who's gone had a book in the series, I think, has been a little surprised at how much editing there is, not just by them, but you know, as series editors, I'm involved with that. But then that goes to the publisher, which in this case is the American Psychological Association. And that can take like a year for it to go through, you know, the development editor and then the copy editor and so forth. And so people don't get, you know, how much work is involved in that. For me, um, I tend to have um, multiple projects going on at the same time. Um, and I, if, if I have a deadline, in most cases, I will meet it. <laughs> so deadlines are helpful for me. A lot of things these days are more open-ended and that's not always a great thing in terms of getting, getting something, uh, done for me, but not for others. Um, the hardest part is getting it down in the first place, you know, getting something on paper, you know, whether it's a chapter, an article or whatever, once it's there, then for me, it's easier to go back and further edit it and so forth, just because that, you know, comes naturally. But the idea of getting it down can be kind of problematic. Now, I'll give you um, a little anecdote from my recent experience and <clears throat> since i retired from my uh, university uh, uh, professorship um, i've been taking up creative writing and 
it's interesting in literary writing, uh, poetry and short stories and so forth. They have all the same problems that we do, only more so because, um, you know, there's a, it's a different process, but it's the same thing. And being in writing groups where you're getting feedback from your peers about what you've written and so forth, you know, it's like, oh, I thought this was really good. And then people find things that, you, do, you know, you don't know and so forth. So to some extent, you have to like the game. <laughs> you know, you have to like doing that. But I'd also say it's somewhat addictive. So if you if if you you know kind of do it and have some good feedback from it and so forth, then you find yourself thinking about oh well, what do I want to do next and what do I want to write next? I've been working on now on a uh, trade book. These books are for professional audiences primarily, and a trade book it's a different kind of writing because you're trying to reach. The general audience that is people that are not people with phds or master's degrees but people that want to learn about that and that's a different kind of writing too and so you know it's um it starts with motivation you know why do i want to do this why do i want to do this particular topic and then it comes with creating uh, a plan i've also been reading about um very successful fiction writers. And there are those who are the planners, you know, when they're writing a novel and they plot, do the complete plot before they even start. And there are those who are not are non-planners and they always want to discover things when they're doing the writing. And that can be fun too. So you start out, you know, in one direction, then you say, oh, this really needs to add more stuff or, I think this will be more effective if I take it in that way. Uh, feedback is also important along the way. You know, you need to get, uh, you may think you're a great writer and you may be, but it still helps to get feedback. And I will also say in writing for professional and technical writing, um, there's always, um, despite the, the inordinately attentive to detail process, you're still going to pick up a book you've written, an article you've written, and find errors, <laughs> and find typos, and that kind of thing. And so I always look forward to correcting them if there is another edition. So you say, oh, I finally fixed that thing. But, you know, that's just part of the turf. And so that's kind of how I work. And also how I help other people work who are trying to, you know, take on writing uh, project part of it's just discipline and you've got you got to want it you got to have the motivation but then you've got to stick with it and figure out a system that works for you to get it done i will say the satisfaction of seeing a book like this when it finally comes out and you see it in print or see it on your um reader um it, it's considerable and much more than i imagined that it might be oh that's exciting given you've written so many you're still excited to see it come out there yeah oh absolutely absolutely yeah. <laughs> well you know i'm curious i mean you are the series editor i'd love to turn to that for a sec um yeah. and i also want to um commend you for receiving an award this year for bringing people into writing right uh, uh the vicky van Veer, uh um uh what was it the uh, award for um do you, i don't know the name of it i'll have to look that one up i'm sorry well, it's sitting here someplace in my study I but to, i sorry. can't find it i was it. actually trying to realize oh and no, i can't do that i'm trying to get it um, so I can take a note of the time, Joni. Don't worry about it. Let's let's just take a just a minute okay. there, so All that right. way you can. So yeah, so Rodney, you actually won an award this year for uh, bringing in new authors and encouraging people to write, and you've brought several people in to write books for the series, the Fundamentals of Consulting Psychology series. I think there are eleven books out now, um, right. and more coming. I was just curious, you know, what you're looking for. What kind of topics, what kinds of, uh, I don't know, maybe perhaps uh, 
words of wisdom you would give to people who might be considering or words to encourage people to submit a proposal? So my simple view of consulting psychology is it's about the three levels we've talked about, individual, group, organizational, and broadly speaking within those, it's about assessment and it's about intervention. So if you look at that as a three by two matrix, we're looking for books that will fill in all those spaces. And so we need, uh, we particularly need a book on uh, teams and consulting to the group level. Um, we have a fair amount on individual. We just have a new book out on systems level work. Um, but additionally, we have a book on consulting to um, national security organizations. We need books that are like that about consulting in particular kinds of contexts. So we need books related to consulting to for-profit organizations, consulting to not-for-profit organizations, consulting to educational institutions. There's plenty of room for that. And, and these, these books are not like you're taking on a life sentence, you know, they're about, yeah. they've been about, what is it, 150 um, pages of manuscript pages, which turns out to be about the same, believe it or not, of, of print pages when you add in all the extras that go into a book. And so, we're looking for people who have expertise in those areas, who hopefully have some writing and interest in those areas. But I'd love to see us have titles in all of those areas. Additionally, we'd like to have some titles related to cons uh, consulting with um, in different um, countries or parts of the world, like consulting in Africa or consulting in Asia, what are some of the things, or South America, what are some of the things that consultants need to be concerned about in terms of understanding what the culture is like? Virtual consulting is another uh, one that uh, there's certainly room for title. And we're not trying to create the, um, the encyclopedic treatment we're trying to say what would a person who's getting started in this area need to know what do you need to know about what's different when you're consulting in Europe uh, than what's different in than when you're consulting in the US so there's plenty of room for lots more uh, titles um, and you know I also suggest to people particularly if if you haven't done uh, a lot of writing, that uh, you consider having a um, um, co-author who can write with you. And maybe it's co-author who's more experienced than you are. Maybe it's someone who's better at the literature, you know, incorporating the literature uh, than, than you might be, but you're really good on incorporating the how-to and the practical examples of that and so forth. Um, these are not chapter books, so we're not interested in producing, you know, uh, books by 20 authors, mm -hmm. all of whom write in their own style and that kind of thing. These are books that need to speak with one voice, but it's perfectly fine to, um, you know, to do that. Now, there is an approval process. First of all, it goes through the internal process with our with our review board uh, for the series, and then it goes to our publisher, APA, and they have to agree that this is a title that they want to publish. And so, um, you know, there's a lot of stuff that goes on up front. What we also need to advise people is we have a format for proposals, and people need to write those carefully, and people need also to consider that this is going to be speaking to their writing ability. So if you send something in that's not clearly written or has a lot of typos and so forth, you know, it's not going to go anywhere because people say, oh, you know, if this is when you're supposed to look your best. And if, if that's not coming through, then you have to be concerned about what, you know, what's going to, uh, what, the, what the full book would look like and that kind of thing. 
And then, of course, also editors and publishers are interested in, are they going to be able to deliver? You know, are people going to be able to deliver it on time? And generally, they'll look to what have you done so far. So it's good to have some things that you've published and so forth. But in any case, this is not just an academic series. This is for um, fine for uh, people in graduate school or postgrad studies and so forth. It's also for practitioners. And we want it to be accessible. And we want these books to be something people can read and say, oh, I get it. You know, or now I know where I need to go to get more information or more training or that kind of thing. So I would be delighted to see more proposals. Mm -hmm. And I'm also happy to talk to anybody uh, who has an idea that they're thinking about and, um, you know, just talk about is that does that have a place, a likely place in the book series? And if so, what's their thought? What are their thoughts about how to uh, proceed with it and what they want to cover and not cover and that kind of thing? In a, in a book of this length, you're you're also dealing with what do you leave out? You know, oh, yeah. it's it's for many, it's uh, harder to write a short story than to write a novel uh, because to write a short story, it's got to be really tightly written, and you've only got like. 20, 30 pages versus 300 or more to pack things in. And same thing here, this fundamentals. So you have to cover the ground you're covering succinctly and accessibly. I want people to read these books and say, oh, I get it. You know, I, I see what that would be like. You know, I really want to know more, that kind of thing. Well, I would also put a little pitch in that Nick and I are going to be interviewing uh, some co-authors as well. So if people yeah. are wondering what it's like to work with somebody you'll hear some interesting experiences i'm sure you don't want to share all of them rodney you can let the co-authors talk about it yeah. well it is it is like a marriage um, and sometimes they work and sometimes they don't but choose your co-author very carefully because um it, it, there can be conflict uh usually People enjoy having co-authors because they don't have to do all the work themselves and they have someone to work closely with and the ultimate product is better than it would have been without that. Uh, but when it doesn't work, it can be <laughs> like a relationship and it's like everyone's glad when it's over. <laughs> Roddy, I think this has been just a wonderful masterclass in the in the background of how to write a book. And for our viewers, I, I hope you were able to take some notes. Well, I can't thank you enough. And on behalf of Joni and I, we are so happy that you're able to join us for this inaugural episode of the SCP podcast. Dr. Lemon, thank you. Joni, thank Pleasure. you so much. We look forward mm -hmm. to seeing you all again in the next episode.